A church is a group of Christians who assemble as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and commands of Christ the King, to affirm one another as his citizens through the ordinances, and to display God's own holiness and love through a unified and diverse people in all the world following the teaching and example of elders. We'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18 this morning. We'll be there and we'll also be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll use that as a springboard in our discussion as we continue to rediscover church. And that is to rediscover things that maybe have fallen into inactivity. Maybe things we haven't thought about, we haven't practiced for some time. And so we have used this series to reacquaint ourselves, to rediscover things that maybe because they've become ritual or become rote or maybe because they just haven't been done for us, we have forgotten all about them. And so your elders have thought it'd be good for us to remind ourselves of some of the important things that make the church the church and to understand the place that the church has in our lives and in the world today. And we have heard at the beginning of each of the sermons a reminder of what the church is. During that video before I come up or the preacher comes up to preach, a definition of the church is given. And each week we've been tackling a part of that definition and this week we come to that the church is a group of Christians who are to display God's own holiness and love. I want you to know right away this morning that one of the missions and purposes of the church and your involvement in it is to display who God is to a watching world. I know you don't feel like it's happening, but you are displaying to the watching community around us who God is, how holy God is, and how loving and kind God is to his creation. And we do that by living life out with one another. And so if we are going to show the world that God is holy, then it is incumbent upon us to be holy. If we're going to show God that he's loving, then it is altogether important that we are loving. And one of the reasons why the world can come back at us and say we're hypocrites is we talk about the holiness of God, we talk about the love of God, and we don't practice it. And so the watching world says, whatever you're offering, you can keep it. But a healthy and vibrant church is a church that declares and demonstrates in practice the holiness of God through our own holiness, the love of God through our loving of not only those closest to us, but those that are in the world. This is what we have to rediscover as a church. And it's not so much that we've lost it, it is to rediscover it so we don't lose it. To reacquaint ourselves so we don't forget it. And that takes discipline. For us to be successful in anything takes a form of discipline. When we talk about our physical bodies, let's just be honest, that it takes discipline if we want them to be healthy. If they want them to have uh, a good shape, it takes discipline. And I like what this individual says here. He says, discipline is success. You hit the gym after a long work day. You minimize consumption of junk food despite cravings. You must exercise consistently even when you don't feel like it. And notice what he says at the end of it. When it comes to our physicality, discipline is the safest road to success. But he says it's not just with our physical bodies. It is in everything you want to achieve. And so we move out of the weight room into the school room and we see that in education, discipline is necessary. Students, you will not pass the class, you will not achieve graduation if you're not disciplined. If you don't discipline yourself to be a good student, if you don't discipline yourself to do your homework, to study for the test, you will fail 
in your attempt and approach to being a good student. When it comes to finances, if we don't discipline ourselves, we're going to run out of money. We're going to waste money. We are going to see our money run right through our hands. And so every money manager will tell you it takes discipline to be a good money manager. It takes discipline to put yourself on a budget. It takes discipline for you to say no to certain things so that you can say yes to other things. It takes discipline in the moment, now, in the present, to enjoy something greater in the future. And I could do this ad nauseum. Wherever you want to find success in every avenue, whether it's work or play, it takes discipline. And so we come to this thing that we say, what is the church? And as followers of Jesus Christ, we want to be a healthy church. We want to be a vibrant church. We want to be a church that gives God glory. We want to be a church that accomplishes what God wants for us. And what we've seen in these three examples is the way to success in those avenues and approaches and and pursuits is discipline. So it is with the church. For the church to be vibrant and healthy, and even more importantly, holy, it takes discipline. And what we're going to learn today is that the very essence and bringing up of these things, these practices, will cause people to push it away. So I want to spend some time reading God's Word and understand that this isn't me coming at this subject with my agenda but it's a biblical agenda that the Bible lays forth. And we're gonna start in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, starting in verse 15. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. This is Jesus talking uh, to us today, and he is saying, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Other translations would say an unbeliever. The idea here is you don't just go on as if everything's okay. But in every instance, every interaction and encounter you have with the person, you're bringing them to the need to repent of their sin. That's what he's saying there. He goes on and says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say to you, if two of three, two of you agree <clears throat> on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now we use that scripture, and we use that scripture when attendance is really bad on a Sunday morning. We're like, well, we got three and Jesus is here. That's good. But I want you to notice the context of the passage. A couple of weeks ago I said we take things out of context. The context of the passage is when two or three of you agree about the sin of a person, it's binding. This is serious business. God says, whatever you do here on earth will be done in heaven. We are ambassadors that are given a heavenly purpose to live out here on the earth. We're going to turn uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because what Jesus gives us, let's just be honest, is the theoretical. If. If. But I, I, I want a little more, Jesus, and I'm so thankful by the gift of the Holy Spirit, we get more. And we get a bad example, meaning we're given an example of a bad church that's not living out church discipline, and, uh, and it's there for us to serve as an example for us. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you're not there, if you're following along in the, the chair Bibles that are, that are there for you, uh, you find this passage on 900 and page 954. Here's a real life situation that was taking place in the church. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of the kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. That is, the unbelievers don't even do this stuff. 
People who never attend church, they don't involve themselves in this type of sin that is evident within the church amongst the people of God. That's what Paul is saying. And here's the sin. A man has his father's wife. It's not his mom, because he would have said a man's with his mom. That's not what is being said here. It's his father's wife. This man is intimate with his stepmom. That's where you're all like, ew. Okay? Not even the unbelievers do that. But notice he says, and you are arrogant. You're celebrating this. You're, you're, you say you're this great place. We're this great church. And by the way, we got this guy who's shacking up with his stepmom. And he says, you ought to rather be mourning. Let the one who has done this, the guy that's shacking up with his stepmom, be removed from among you. This guy calls himself a Christian and is doing this heinous thing, and you guys are going along as if everything's just fine. He says, get this guy out from among you. He goes on in verse 6, and he says, your boasting is no good. Do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? That is, the little sin contaminates the whole. That's what Paul is saying here. So cleanse out that little leaven that's in there that you may be a new lump, that you might be clean because you really are unleavened bread. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So therefore, let us celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So I wrote to you. So here's the principle. So the practice, guys shacking up with his stepmom. And what's the word for the entire congregation? Here's what he says. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now notice what he says. He gives a disclaimer here. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, meaning the unbelievers. You need to associate with the unbelievers because if you don't associate with them, how will they ever know the gospel? And so what he's saying is, is you don't need to associate with Christians who say that they love Jesus and are sexually immoral. He goes on, he says, not just sexually immoral, but the greedy, the swindlers, the idolaters. He says, of all of this, I'm writing that you not associate with one who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater or a reviler, a drunkard or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. You don't interact with believers who have thrown the commands of Scripture away and are living for themselves. And he says this, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those on the outside. So purge the evil person from among you. Can I just say this before we move on? One of the reasons why the church isn't very vital and vibrant in our day to day is we're too busy judging the world and not ourselves. Far too often I see on social media Christians in judgment against the world. God says, that's my problem. That's my issue. The thing you should be judging is your own life and the life of the believers you're in community with. And we fail at this. And the reason why is like petulant little teenage children, we don't want discipline in our lives. And so when we approach this thing, we approach a problem. We approach a problem. Write this down. We've got a problem with this subject. For some of you, you saw what we're going to talk about today, and you said, and maybe you're new to the church, and you saw it, and you go, you got to be kidding me. I'm out. I'm out. Or here goes Tim. He's going to be all authoritarian. He's going to be all top down, and, and I don't want that. And the reason why isn't because you've heard where the church is at on it. You just don't like the idea of discipline, and there's different reasons why. So what may be the problem with discipline? Let's just be honest. It's sin. It's sin. Sin, when we all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God, I'm there with you. And the last thing sinners want is to be confronted with sin. We see that with our spiritual forefathers and mother, Adam and Eve. 
when sin comes in the world, the last thing we want to do is face God or face anyone else. So we run in shame. We run trying to hide our sin. And so the last thing we want is discipline to expose our sin. And because we're all sinners, the last thing we want is to be exposed. And so we've got a problem with this. But, but not only is, is that a problem, but we've got a God who says, I'm going to do this for your good. I'm going to do it. And, and we don't trust that God is doing it for our good. And we need to understand, and I want to make sure I communicate this on the front end, and I'll communicate it on the back end as well, is that when I'm talking about discipline within the church, I'm talking about loving correction. Because if you separate discipline from love, you get abuse. And that's not what I'm talking about, and that's not what I'm uh, validating, and that's not what I'm proclaiming to you. I'm proclaiming a loving father who cares and loves for us so deeply that he longs for the best for us, which means he's got to correct us from time to time. And let's just be honest that as a parent, anytime I've disciplined my children, and I know parents, you've been there, especially in the teenage years, that at no point when you discipline your child do they say, hey, thanks a lot. I am in such good hands that my parents would ground me from driving. Have I told you guys I love you? It's so sweet and so good. I'm gonna tell all my friends how great you are because you're keeping me from that event. You are the best. We're all teenagers at heart. When discipline comes, we don't see it as a good. We don't thank God for that goodness. We strike out in anger, this isn't fair. This isn't right. You don't love me. And God says, I do love you. So you make God out to be a liar. And you say the truth is not in him. Well, where does this come from? Well, it comes from sin. But can I add it comes from society? It comes from society. We've got a lot of weight that society's pushing back on this subject. I like what Albert Moeller says about this problem when he says the following, the decline of church discipline may be the most visible failure of the contemporary church. No longer concerned with maintaining purity of confession or lifestyle, the church today sees itself as a voluntary association of members with minimal moral accountability to God, much less to one another. We don't want to be holy. And even if we do want to be holy, we don't need God to help us with it, and surely we don't need other sinners to help us in the process. And so we push it away. And the reason why is not because we're following God's word, but because we're following society. So let's talk about some societal things that give us this lackadaisical approach to church discipline. The first one is is just our American culture. Thanks to our founding fathers, we're revolutionaries. We wave the flag, don't tread on me. And that flag waves in our political realm, but it also waves in our Christian realm. Hey, other Christians, stay in your lane. Preacher, don't get in my business. You deal with your stuff, I'll deal with mine. Let's put up fences, you stay on your side, I'll stay on mine, and everything will be great. That may work in America, it doesn't work within the church. That may work in paganism, it doesn't work in Christianity. God says we're the body of Christ, we need one another, we are connected to one another, there's no fences, we are bound together as one. And our American culture says that's not the case. There's a second thing, and that is this consumer-driven model of ministry. At some point, churches took on this idea that we're a business. And what comes with business is the need for customers. And with the need for customers is the job of the business to do what customers want. And you live by the golden rule in business that the customer is always right. You're right. And so as a result of that, who am I to tell you, the consumer, you, the customer, that you're wrong? Who am I to tell you through God's word that you're wrong? You're right, and my job is to placate to your needs, to address your needs, to cater to your needs, so that you'll keep coming back. 
And the most foolish thing that I can do right now is preach this kind of sermon that says, you and I were wrong. We're wrong and God's right. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we need to be quiet and he needs to speak. And I include myself in that of those who need to hear. And so we lose that ability to confront. The third thing is, is just ignorance to this. Some of you are new to this. And you're like, you guys do what? You confront and you, you think back to that Lifetime movie of Amish shunning that took place. And you're like, I don't like that. That doesn't seem altogether right and good. Or maybe you don't have any idea and you're like, really? I thought God was a loving God. Why would he do that? Because God says he's a loving parent and loving parents discipline their kids for their good. And so maybe you need to learn this in my prayers and my hope is a message like this and the information we have in the bulletin at that QR code that you can see will give you more information why this is such an important thing. The fourth one is that we have misinterpreted the words of Jesus. So Christians are like, why are you talking about this? This, this, and you'll see this on Facebook all the time. You'll see a reel about this. And someone will say, why is there so much judgment in the church when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged yourself? Oh, we're using the words of Jesus now. And what Jesus says there is, you're not to judge. No. No, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged yourself. Meaning, if you are or when you're going to judge people, you judge your, the people around you to the same level under the same circumstances that you would want to be judged. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, we're told we're not to judge the world, but we are to judge one another. That we are to be examining one another, to look into one another's life, to, to even speak truth of conviction into one another's lives. And so uh, we need to be careful we don't misinterpret the scriptures to fit our narrative. Finally, for most of us, we've never heard a sermon preached on church discipline. And the only time, listen, that we've ever heard church discipline talked about isn't in the church, but it's in high school English class. You're like, what are you talking about? I read two books in high school per my public school teacher's recommendation as an assignment about church discipline. Let's start with the crucible. The crucible. A story of a church in Salem, Massachusetts that put people to death because they thought they were witches. So let's introduce a bunch of high school students to church discipline. So a bunch of people got together and tried to figure out who the witches in the community are and whether they floated or didn't float. I can't remember, I wasn't that good in English. We got this subjective test, this stupid test by which we are going to do it and it's vindictive, it's vengeful. And so high school students hear about church discipline and they're like, I don't want that. You're saying that comes from God? You can keep that, Arthur Miller. Then, the English teacher says, I need you to read another book, The Scarlet Letter. A young lady in the church is impregnated. She has no husband. And the community, the church community around her, kicks her out of the church, and not only kicks her out of the church, but affixes by law the letter A to every garment that she wears so that everybody would know her sin. Now, this is ugly for a high schooler to read, and they're like, my goodness, I, I don't want to be a part of church if that's what church is going to do. And then it gets even uglier. Because as you read in the Scarlet Letter, as I did, I finished the book, it's the preacher. Who's the father? Spoiler. Yeah, spoiler, sorry. Watch the movie. Oh, don't watch the movie. I don't know what the movie has, okay? <laughs> right, read the book, okay? Um, it's the preacher, the one who led in the discipline who's actually the secret sinner. And so why do we approach this subject matter with such hostility and all that? Because we've allowed society to tell us what church discipline is instead of God and his word. 
And so let's start talking about God and his word. What's the policy that needs to address this situation? We're gonna move through these things quickly. Why do we need this? Why do we need Matthew 18? Why do we need 1 Corinthians 5? Why do we need, by the way, 1 Timothy 5 when it comes to leaders who sin? Why do we need these passages? Number one, write this down. God's holiness demands it. God's holiness demands it. Listen, God is holy. And if he's holy and he's invited you into his family, the thing that he wants from his family, demands from his family is holiness. That's the house rules. God demands holiness of his people. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter five, you are to be holy as my father in heaven is holy. And if we're not holy, we need corrective measures that bring us into holiness because God knows that we are sinners. So he, the holy God, leads us and guides us and yes, at times corrects us and disciplines us to holiness. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 12, verses five through 11, that it speaks as God, our heavenly Father, corrects us as our earthly fathers did for our good. So the holiness of God demands it. Write this down. Scriptures declare it. So all throughout the Bible, we see that God is going to correct sin. We see that in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. God doesn't overlook sin. There's a consequence to sin. We see it uh, in um, uh, Joshua chapter 7. When the people of God are advancing in the promised land and all of a sudden they come to a screeching halt in Joshua 7 and they lose a battle that God says they were going to win and Joshua goes to God and he says, wait a minute, what gives? You said we were gonna win and now we've lost and God says there's sin in the camp. And it'd be really easy for us to say, well, that's terrible. All of the people must have been bad and that's why there was a consequence in all people. Listen, God's covenant people were stymied in receiving God's blessing, not because of the sin of all or the sin of the majority. Joshua 7 says it takes one of us to have sin to stop the forward kingdom advancement for all. And you're like, well, why would that be? Can I just tell you the weight of responsibility in this area crushes me, and it's this. If I blow it, it will have dramatic, a dramatic negative result to this church. I will allow the name of Christ to be defiled in our community. I thought that church was about God's holiness and their pastor did what? Their pastor said what? Their pastor practiced what? And if we want to stop God's advancement of his kingdom in our lives, it takes one of us. It takes a leader, it takes a person, one of us to stymie what God wants to do. So let me do a math problem with you. If God's holiness demands it, plus God's word declares it, it equals the church must do it. Is that simple enough? If God's holiness demands it and scripture declares it, then that means we gotta do it. If we're going to call ourselves God's people and God says, I want you to do it, we should be doing it. And when we don't do it, we do it to our own, don't do it to our own demise. And so who does it involve? Let's look at the people and the scenarios that this involves. Who's to receive church discipline? It might surprise you, but church discipline is for all Christians. It's for all Christians. We are told in the Bible... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you have fallen short of the glory of God, you need God to formingly, correctively bring you into his holiness. And so all Christians need it. You need it, I need it, we all need it. The second group of people that need it are those who are caught in sin. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. I'll read it for us, write it down. It's an important passage and one that we need to know and recognize. If any of you 
is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in all gentleness, remembering that you too could be tempted. So let's break that down for a moment. What is church discipline? Church discipline is for those who are caught in sin. Notice the generalities that are given. If any one of you, any of us could be caught in sin. Notice, if any of you are caught in any sin, it doesn't say the major vices that we wanna work up in our head, that's what brings church discipline. If any of you are caught in any sin, you who are spiritual, that means the other believers in the midst, those who aren't caught in that sin, are to restore them. Now notice the word restore, that's restore, not rebuke, not chastise, not beat up, not threaten. You are to restore him or her with all gentleness, that word gentleness is literally, uh, the picture is a, of a mother cradling a child. That's us handling precious things. We are to do it with all gentleness, with the reminder that we too could be caught in sin ourselves. We could fall prey to that trap of the devil's as well and that keeps us from being haughty that keeps us from being arrogant that keeps us from being judgmental in as much as we cast judgment you're caught in sin but it's not i can't believe you got caught in that sin no christian that i know would ever do that i'd pick that up okay the next one that we have is those who are in conflict with others Matthew 18. So who's church discipline for? It is your policy. Listen to me. Matthew 18 is the policy handbook for what happens when sinners offend sinners. And God says, listen, I'm going to be leaving you soon, and I don't want you to just keep fighting with one another. So when a fight breaks out among you, when you're offended by someone, the first thing you do is you go to that person and you try to write it. You try to rectify it. So you go to the person and it says you show them their sin. That means that this has got to be a legitimate gripe. This can't be that you're just offended because um, your sensibilities were shaken. This is, you can show the person in the Bible that what they did was not just offensive to you, another sinner, but it was offensive to God. And by the way, that your love can't cover because the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins so when someone offends you and your love goes as far as it can and, and it can't cover it then you got to go to the person can I tell you this is the most omitted thing that we do in the church what we do is we gather people around us to pray about it so can we just get together pastor Tim offended me can we just pray for him what a sinful pre preacher he is he should know better can I tell you how he offended me can we pray about it? And you feel really spiritual because you had a prayer meeting about it. Really, it was gossip, but you added prayer to it, so hats off to you. We don't go to the person, and instead, we gossip about them, we slander them, we tell others about them. We're to go, and if that person doesn't respond well, we're supposed to take one or two other people, and the purpose of that, listen, is that they can verify through evidence that what you've said is true, okay? So they go and they say, listen, yeah, yeah, I saw it too. And you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to say you're sorry because I saw what you did to that person and that was sinful. It was offensive to God. It was offensive to your brother or sister in Christ. And if at that point the, pe the person says no, no, then you'd go to church leaders, and church leaders are to assess the situation and, and to ascertain what the next steps are. 
This is why we have to have good leaders because they got to be men of judgment and discernment to be able to discern what's going on here. Is it just a spat that everybody needs to allow bygones to be bygones? Is there a real offense? And is there a posture of rebellion in the person that even in the company of two witnesses, they still say, forget you guys. Then it's the church who says, the leaders as representatives, hey, you got to fix this. You gotta rectify this. And if they say, forget you to the church, Jesus says, then you cast them out as a tax collector and as a pagan, meaning you just can't keep living life as if everything's okay, that what you do in every experience with them is you bring them back to their need, the need to repent. And so this is what the policy says. But church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5 isn't a fight between two people. It involves believers who live in contradiction to the word. So there was a guy in 1 Corinthians 5 who said he was a believer. He told everybody in the church and outside the church, I'm a believer. He knew the word of God. He committed to walk in light of the word of God and now he comes in and he starts telling the small group he's a part of, well, I've started being romantic with my dad's new wife. Isn't that awesome? And the small group says, it is awesome. Good for you. Bring her along to small group next time and we can be one happy family. And Paul catches word of this and he's like, you got to be kidding me. I go to, uh, to the marketplace, and I don't hear them talking about guys getting it on with their stepmoms. This is unbecoming for the world, let alone the church, and you guys are arrogant about it. And what does he say? Kick that boy out of here. Get rid of him. And the reason why you get rid of him is you cannot endorse him any longer. You cannot, the church cannot endorse, listen to me, and this may scare some people, the church cannot endorse Christians who live like sinners. And when confronted about it, say, I don't care. That's the big important part we can't forget. This guy said, I don't care what God says. I don't care what his word says. I am going to be flamboyant and I am going to announce to the church and the world, I do what I do. I'm a law unto myself. And what Paul says is deliver him to Satan. And we freak out. Oh my goodness, what does that mean? We have a picture of that, by the way, when the prodigal son gives the, I'm sorry, when the father gives to the prodigal son his inheritance and he allows the son to go live a life of debauchery. And it is the life of debauchery that leads the man, the son, back to the heavenly father. So the church says to that individual, you will not listen to me. You will not listen to God's rules for his house. And so we release you and we say, Let sin and its consequences be your teacher. And we pray that before this day is done, we pray before this life is over, that the consequences of sin will sober you and bring you back to God and to his people. Friends, this is serious business. And so we need to be doing this. Well, who are we to do it with? Who needs discipline? A couple other people, because the Bible talks about it often. Write these passages down. First Corinthians 3, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. 1 Thessalonians 3, 6, we are to warn those who are spiritually idle. Romans 16, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, we are to warn those who are divisive. 1 Corinthians 5, we are to... Uh, Confront those who practice immorality. So how do we do it? What's the process and the steps to follow? We're almost done here. How does church discipline play itself out? Two ways. Important you write these down. Because the first one's gonna surprise you. You're under church discipline right now. Did you know it? Every one of us. Every one of us are under the first step of church discipline. And you're like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 what do you know? Here's what first step of church discipline is. It's formative. It's formative. And so you made a decision this morning, a disciplined decision, 
Maybe someone forced you to do it, but I'm going to hope and pray that you did this of your own volition, your own will. And that is you said, I want to be with God's people today. You could be home. You could be cutting the grass after a rainy week. You could be preparing yourself for another bear's loss. You could be doing a lot of things, okay? But you made a decision. I want to be with God's people where God's name is prayed, praised, where God's word is proclaimed, where prayers are lifted up in God's name for our betterment. And you made a conscious decision. I want to be here. You disciplined yourself for godliness, Paul tells Timothy. A healthy church has formative discipline going on every day at every moment, and that's what makes churches healthy. And I believe Village is a healthy church because there's formative discipline just happening, and we want discipline in the lives of our kids. And so right now, there's formative discipline happening in the lives of the children that are hearing about God's word right now. On Wednesday nights, our students are being formed in godliness by discipline of picking up God's word and involving themselves in the fellowship of God's people amongst their peers, and they're doing life together. That's formative discipline. We do that when we gather in small groups. We do that every day that we pick up God's word and we read it. Every time we take moments to pray, we're forming in us holiness to show the outside world. And that's healthy. And that should be going on. We should be disciplining ourselves towards godliness. And when that fails, when that doesn't happen, parents, you get this. You've been forming in your children discipline about what you expect, and so you've been teaching them. Say please and thank you. Help people. Don't speed, don't this, don't that. Do this, do that. You're forming for them. And what happens when they don't do those things that they've learned? Corrective discipline comes. So the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg is corrective discipline. That gets all the bad press. The formative is the iceberg underneath the water. It's huge. And so a healthy church does all this formative discipline in the lives of its people. It encourages this. It it praises this. It it equips for this so that corrective discipline is not needed. But we're sinners, and corrective discipline will come. And my prayer is that when corrective discipline comes, you will heed it, whether it's given to you by a peer or by your church leaders or by the collective voice of the church, and that if you're the one giving it, that you will do it with gentleness for the purpose of restoring. And so here's what we need to pray, and I'll close with a statement that I think helps to just bring my heart into this. We've got to pray that we keep doing the hard things. And the hard things aren't just going around correcting people, it is forming in people the holiness that God demands, that the scriptures declare. And so we're gonna keep picking up this book and we're gonna keep looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we're gonna follow him. And when those who profess to be following him do not live up to that, we who are both sinners as well graciously and lovingly bring correction to their lives you can read more in our bulletins Uh, in the bulletin there's a QR code that you can follow there's much more I would say this but let me close with this as the worship team comes out and prepares us for our closing song Uh, this is the heart of the matter And it's this on church discipline. Church discipline is not a group of pious policemen who uh, are out to catch a criminal. Rather, it's a group of brokenhearted brothers and sisters seeking to restore an erring family member. I know you've heard a lot today, and I don't, you know, I'll go home, and these are one of the Sundays where I start beating myself up wondering, was I clear Listen to me in all love and affection. This is not for us, and I forget the character. I think it was, was Gomer Pyle and Mayberry who said, citizens arrest. Young people just like, what just happened to Pastor Tim? 
We're not, our job isn't to be citizen police officers looking like the Pharisees did to all the wrongs that people do. But as loving mothers and fathers, as loving brothers and sisters, we're looking out for one another. And here's why. Because we want to be the best picture of God's holiness and love to a watching world. And if we do that right, how sweet and beautiful it will be for the community of Sugar Grove and the surrounding communities that we come from to know that this place is serious about God's holiness and serious about God's love. Amen?